Well, good morning, Grace. If you're new here, my name is Clay, one of the pastors, along with Mark and Jared. I welcome you once again to our Sunday gathering where we love to dig into the Bible. And you'll hear us say this over and over again, that we love to teach and preach through books of the Bible because we believe this is truly God's word given to us. And now we typically do that uh, going through an entire book at a time, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we want to help you to understand who Jesus is based on what we actually see in the scriptures. We don't just want to cherry pick a verse here and a verse there, take it out of its context and make it say whatever we wanted to say. We want the scriptures to be, we want to expose you to the scriptures so that what you see here is what's actually in the Bible. So we have been continuing on in our series going through the gospel of Luke. We took a little bit of a break for summer, but we jumped right back into chapter six. And so if you would not mind turning with me to Luke chapter 6, whether that is in book or app form, bring out your Bible, and it's going to be very helpful for you to be able to follow along. We're going to be in verses 43 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 49, and before we do that, let's just pray to set our hearts right to hear from God's Word. Father, I just ask that this morning you would guide us, that you would speak to us through your Word, you would challenge us, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you want for us. Father, if there's things in here that we need to be convicted of, convict us. If there's things in here that need to comfort us, please comfort us. Help us to grow closer to you, to depend on you more, and to rely on your spirit to work in us and through us as we look at your scriptures. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so let's listen as the scriptures are on the screen behind me, and then we'll start digging in together. Reading from Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 49. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building his house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So like I mentioned, getting back into into the book of Luke here, after we took a little bit of a break for the summer, we jumped right in to the middle of chapter 6, where Jesus is continuing on in this great sermon that we often refer to as the Sermon on the Plain. Some people think that this is all a different angle that the Sermon on the Mount was. We don't know for sure, so it might be a different sermon. It might be the same sermon seen from a different account. But either way, if it is a different sermon, Jesus liked to say the same things over and over again because I don't know if you've noticed, maybe you're not like me, but you forget things and you need reminders. Jesus probably had to continue to remind people again and again too. So two weeks ago, when we jumped right back into this sermon again, we saw one of Jesus' most difficult commands to obey. And that's where he tells us to love our enemies. And last week, we followed that up with one of the most misused verses. And so many people take this out of context too, and where it's where Jesus says, judge not. And so now today, as Jesus concludes his sermon, he's going to tie all these things together, everything that had come up so far, and he's going to ask us a very difficult question. He wants to know, do we look like followers of Jesus? So we have to remember that this this sermon that Jesus is preaching, it comes from right on the heels of Jesus returning from an intense all-night time of prayer. See, Jesus had devoted himself in his humanity to seek the will of his Father in heaven, to choose 12 specific men as his apostles. And he chose them as those to go out and eventually be sent to represent him in a very special way in order to show the world who God is and what he's like. But to all those listening and to all those who get to hear these words years later, I mean, that, that's us too, right? Jesus also wants us to know that it's not just his apostles who represent him. 
but it's actually anyone who calls, himself, calls themselves a disciple of Jesus that they're now also called to be his representative. See, if we say we want to follow Jesus, which is what a disciple is, it's a follower of Jesus, that means we too represent Jesus to the world. We're his ambassadors. So then as a follower of Jesus, Jesus lays out all these different characteristics of what should it look like to follow Jesus? And so he, he goes into a, a few of these characteristics where he says, we're to be a people who don't think highly of ourselves, who understand our deep need for God's work in our lives. And as we do that, we also demonstrate that we understand the great mercy that God has shown us. And that should then allow us to now go forward and love our enemies, to be a blessing to those around us, to be people who give and live with generous hearts, people who are graciously forgiven or forgiving just as we have been forgiven. So rather than walking around with puffed up chests and inflated egos because of how great we think we are, thinking that, well, of course God chose me, look how awesome I am, we actually get to rest in the identity of our Savior Jesus, knowing that it's because of his work that's the only thing we can boast in. We boast in Jesus' work for our account, for our sake, in spite of us. But again, Jesus is getting us to ask and evaluate ourselves and think through, is our identity found in him? If we call ourselves Christians, if we say we are his disciples, if we proclaim to follow Jesus, do our actions actually line up? This is how Jesus says it in verses 43 to 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn, bush, thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now, did you notice that the very first part of this in verse 43 begins with the word for? It can also be translated as because or since or in light of all of this, that means Jesus is linking these specific words back to what he just spoke about. He's linking it back to the parable that Mark walked us through last week, where Jesus asks, can a blind man lead a blind man? And then he, he gives us this picture of how we can't remove the speck from our brother's eye unless we first take out the big plank that's in our eye. So in a sense, he's saying, if you want to lead others, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to call others to follow you, as you follow me, then you need to be someone who's worth following. And how do we know if someone's worth following? Jesus says, it's by their fruit. Now, maybe some of you have just taken a big sigh of relief. You go, whew, okay, I thought for a second that he was talking about me. Thankfully, it's about leaders. So, I mean, I don't really want to be a leader. I've never wanted to be a leader. I, I'm okay with not being a leader. So I guess this just doesn't apply to me. You know, I was getting a bit scared there. I don't, I don't want to have to evaluate my life because, I mean, that's scary, right? But if this is just for leaders, I guess I don't have to worry about this. But is that, is, do you think that's what Jesus is actually saying? I mean, if, the thing is, if that's, if that's you, unfortunately, you, you're missing some important context because the implications of this are actually that if you are a follower of Jesus or you claim to be a follower of Jesus, then you are, in a sense, a de facto leader as well. See, to be a disciple of Jesus is one who actually engages in relationship with him and then follows him. And part of following Jesus is to invite others to follow him, to invite others to live lives in accordance with who Jesus is. So the, the beauty is that in this new covenant age we live in, Jesus has actually declared us, his church, to be a kingdom of priests. Now, that's not to say there aren't levels and layers of leadership, because the New Testament's actually pretty clear that there are to be pastors and teachers, designated church leaders who are to bear that responsibility for the flock of God that's among them, all under the leadership and lordship of Jesus. But to those who identify as a part of Jesus' church, the truth is, in a way, we are all called to be our brothers and sisters' keepers. None of us get to say, I'm not a leader. We're all called to collectively lead and submit to one another under the full lordship and leadership of Jesus. 
It's even like Mark brought it last week, where we need the humility to be able to take the logs out of our own eyes so that we can remove the specks from our brother's eyes. That takes some leadership. That takes some ownership. See, we don't want to buy into the concept that we are either only a leader or only a follower. Every leader needs to also be a follower. And likewise, even the newest of Christians get to take part in helping lead others to Jesus. Even those who've been Christians for a long time. But again, back to the verse at hand, Jesus wants to think about and evaluate fruit. And he's thinking, he's getting us to ponder both our fruit as well as the fruit from those we would follow. Now, the beauty, like I said, of this being something that we get to see elsewhere in Scripture because Jesus taught a similar thing that we see in the Gospel of Matthew. In chapter 7, he taught, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually uses this same example, good fruit and bad fruit. But in there, he's talking specifically, warning people about false prophets and false teachers. So we want to take all this into consideration, but we still want to think through, how are we supposed to look inside someone's heart? I mean, we can't evaluate a person's heart, can we? I mean, truth be told, if, if it were possible that you could look into my heart, you might go, oh, well, you might go, why would I want to do that? Because I don't want to look into his heart. And I would go, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to look into my heart and see deep into my motives on a consistent basis because I know what's in there and it, and it scares me. And, and, and at times, it's going to be hard to even just discern what's going on in our own hearts, isn't it? But just because we can't perfectly see into someone's heart, that doesn't mean the heart actually never reveals itself, right? Now, whenever we see the heart talked about in Scripture, we need to know it's not just that beating thing in our heart that's pumping blood, right? Now, hopefully that, that's obvious, right? But something that's probably not as obvious is that when Scripture talks about the heart, we don't want to reduce it to the thing that carries our emotions either. It's not just the emotional center of our being, it's actually the motivational center of our being. We need to know, yeah, emotions play a part in, in the heart. It's not that emotions don't play a factor. But your motivations and your emotions, you can't be putting those things together. They're not the same thing. And we have to add to it, too, that Scripture tells us that the heart is deceitful. Who can understand it? So then this is where the fruit comes in. Or you could also say this is where the, the produce comes in. So why don't you just think, just for a second, what is it that your heart produces? What kind of thoughts, what kind of actions, what kind of words, what kind of deeds seem to come out of your heart? Are you quick to anger? Quick to gossip? Stingy? Are you self-focused? Are you slow to offer mercy, but swift in exacting vengeance? Maybe let's de- dig a little deeper still. What are your deepest desires? What is it that gives you passion, excitement, or what even just gets you up in the morning? See, it's by evaluating these things we can actually begin to discern what's happening in our hearts. And I know this might be controversial, but didn't Jesus say something along the lines of where your treasure is, there your heart will be also? Specifically, he's talking about money. Now, we're, we're going to get there when he talks about in, in chapter 12 of Luke, but what would your wallet or your credit card statement say that your heart is? What's on the priority list for when it comes to your finances? When you think of your budget, where you get some extra money, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Where do your first fruits go? Jesus says, tree is known by its fruits, or its fruit. So you have to know that the fruit brings clarity to what kind of tree it is. See, one who makes a habit of sin is revealed to have a sinful heart. And one who makes a habit of good works, therefore, must have a redeemed heart. Now, it's also interesting that Jesus uses these two different examples of vegetation when he's talking about where to expect or receive or not receive good fruit. As far as the fruit goes, he gives these two examples of figs and grapes, and both were very common fruit in Israel, highly desired, and people just liked them in Israel. 
But both of the examples he gives of where you won't find these two kinds of fruit are bushes that actually deter you from receiving fruit. So first he talks about thorn bushes. Those are probably obvious as, as to what they have, right? Just thorns and thistles, not much else. So if we want to try to maybe put this into people terms, what kind of people would these thorn bushes be? Those are probably the kind that are pretty easy to spot as not followers of Jesus, right? There's, there's just no fruit to be seen. Nothing but thorns and thistles. You go up to them, you get caught in their vicinity, you end up either pricked, poked, hurt, or bleeding. So these are people that are just obviously ignoring God's commands, and they're probably also angry, bitter, resentful, and unforgiving. Probably pretty easy to spot based on the complete lack of fruit. But then Jesus also mentions bramble bushes. Now, if you're anything like me, before looking this up, I never actually knew what a bramble bush was. Maybe some of you heard, have heard what it is, but it's basically a blackberry bush. And you might go, oh, well, blackberries are tasty. We don't need to get caught up on the fact that blackberries taste great, which they do, they're delicious, but that they're not figs and they're not grapes. So it, if you're looking for figs and grapes, you don't go to a blackberry bush. Now, our family took a trip to BC back in the summer. There were blackberry bushes everywhere around Vancouver. And yeah, they're delicious, they're tasty. But the thing is, if you're not careful when picking a blackberry, you can get easily poked and pricked. But not only that, they actually grow like weeds. They can take over an entire area in no time. So now, if you're trying to think about what Jesus is trying to say when he talks about this bramble bush, what kind of people might he be referring to? These are the ones who, who might look like they have some fruit. It bears some resemblance to fruit. But once you get closer, it's revealed that they're also covered with thorns and thistles. And the ideas they, they carry, which are really unhelpful and potentially hurtful, they can actually easily spread and take over an entire area. So then it's, it's almost like Jesus is saying there's three kinds of people. See, the, the first are those who bear no fruit. They claim to be a follower of Jesus. There's just no evidence at all. They profess with their lips. That's it. Now, second, though, there's those who look like they bear fruit. They say they, they belong to Jesus, they follow Jesus, and it looks like they actually do some of the right things. Inwardly, they're cold, they're self-absorbed, and they're hurtful. See, this is probably the hypocrite that Jesus was talking about if we look back at verse 42. And then finally, there are those who, by the work of God's Spirit, they follow Jesus, and they actually produce works that fall in line with a heart of repentance, thankfulness, and joy. See, it's the good tree who, who knows they have their issues. They know they need some weeding and pruning. They do their best to take the planks out of their own eye. And they actually ask others to help them. But their deepest motivation, in amongst all the muddiness of, you know, all of our imperfections and imperfect motivations, the deepest motivation that the good tree has is to honor, obey, and glorify God. Do you know why they want to honor, obey, and glorify God? It's because what we see in verse 45 has to do with what their heart treasures. Do you see that? It doesn't just necessarily say that it's the good heart that produces good, right? But the good fruit comes out of the good treasure of his heart. You see, when we treasure Jesus, we'll end up just finding ourselves producing good fruit. See, it's not like we have these hearts that are 100% fully good or 100% fully bad if we've been saved by Jesus. We know that our hearts are broken. Our motivations are mixed. Even when we want to, we don't always do rightly, think rightly, or feel rightly. We don't always have a pure motivation. But the beauty is that when we treasure Jesus, he continues to change our hearts. Our hearts actually change. And when we treasure Jesus, we rightly recognize that he is not just our Savior, but he's also our Lord. But then there are going to be those who proclaim Jesus to be Lord. And, those are, and yet, they still don't treasure Jesus. And so this is who Jesus challenges in verse 46. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? So he says there's going to be people who claim to be his disciples, who seem to cry out to Jesus, even calling him Lord, 
And yet he doesn't do what they tell him. So here's the crazy thing. If Jesus is your Lord, if he's your master, if you say that you treasure him, that should imply that you're willing to obey him, right? So then to call Jesus Lord and not do what he tells you, that just doesn't make sense, does it? That's like being a vegan carnivore. Which one is it? Is Jesus Lord or are you Lord? Who makes the decisions in your life? Again, think back to the trees and ask yourself, do you show any signs of fruit? Do you show any signs that you have a desire to live in such a way that declares Jesus to be Lord of your life? Now, I know in some circles, there's a lot of talk about not wanting to appear like a Pharisee, not wanting to look like a legalist or a religious hypocrite. Don't worry, we'll, we'll deal with them yet, but you need to know that wanting to obey Jesus does not make you a legalist. Jesus clearly wants you to obey. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to do what he says. It means you don't just get to live life however you want without ever even getting to know Jesus, without even seeing what it means for him to be Lord, and then just assuming, well, Jesus died for my sins, so what does it matter how I live? Grace covers me, doesn't it? You need to know that's an abuse of grace. That's a complete misunderstanding of what the grace of God is. See, grace doesn't just cover our past sin, but it's God's grace that actually gives us the ability to walk in obedience. The ability to embrace these newfound desires that God gifts us with when he saves us, when he indwells us by his spirit, to now live in such ways to show the world who God is and what he's like. See, if if we live in such a way that we show the world that God doesn't care about sin, You know, it's no big deal. God's just some feeble old grandpa up in the sky. He's too tired to deal with lazy and rebellious grandkids. If that's how we live, then by our actions, we lie about God's character. We disregard the truth and the beauty of who he is. So how could we who claim to be followers of Jesus so trample on the grace of God and the character of God by continuing to disregard and disobey his good command, abusing his grace. Like Paul says, should we sin so that grace abounds? No means, by no means. Like, are you guys kidding me? That's what Paul's saying. Jesus says a tree is known by his fruit. And if you start to look and there's no fruit, you need to ask yourself that very difficult question. Am I actually a believer? Now, I know there's going to be a problem that arises when we we all face times where we find ourselves disobeying. We end up doing the things we don't want to do and and not doing the things we do want to do. And just like Paul the Apostle, he he said those things of himself back in Romans chapter 7. The truth is there's a war within us where even if we have been born again, made new by the Spirit of God, our flesh still wants to win. There's a part of us that still wants to do things our own way, to do whatever's convenient, whatever's easier. It's a battle. But that's where we need to try to ascertain what are actually the deepest desires of my heart. Do I want to obey Jesus? Do I want to have a relationship with him? Am I thankful for his death, burial, and resurrection on my account? Do I treasure Jesus? Or at the very least, do I want to treasure Jesus? See, the question isn't whether we feel those things perfectly and consistently, but do we see any fruit that lines up with those things being true. Now, here's the thing. If you're now maybe feeling super worried about this, I just want to comfort you for a second because the bad tree, 
they're likely not even asking themselves these questions. They typically just carry on thinking, it doesn't matter. I'll do my own thing, and God loves me just as I am, so why does anybody bother judging my actions? Now, if you do see some fruit, which is good, maybe some of you are still maybe wondering, am I a bramble bush? Am I the religious hypocrite? Or am I just a regular Christian, a sinner saved by grace who's struggling to obey? Am I a regular Christian or am I a Pharisee, legalist? So even there, I think the deepest question you need to ask yourself is, what's my deepest motivation? What seems to be the main treasure in my heart? Why do I obey? And, it, and this is where I think a lot of people seem to get confused. Again, because they start conflating their heart with their emotions or their feelings. So they might seem, say things like, well, there are times that I don't really feel like obeying. So then if I do obey, am I not just being a hypocrite? Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've asked yourself that question. And that's because we often act like hypocrisy means to feel one thing and to do another. But here's the thing, though. That's, it's not hypocrisy when you do something in spite of your feelings for the sake of obeying God. That's not hypocrisy. See, the hypocrite is the one who's always trying to put on a show for others. They don't care what God thinks. They aren't obeying for the sake of God's glory, but for the sake of appearing obedient to those around them. It's all about their own glory. They're putting on a show. They're putting on a mask for the people around them to think that they're obedient to God. See, it's actually the true believer, the good tree that says, I know my motives are mixed. I know they're potentially impure. I know that my feelings lie to me, but I'm not gonna let my feelings decide whether to obey or disobey. I'm gonna decide to follow what I know Jesus wants me to do. So when you don't feel like doing something that you know you should do, what you do is you repent for not feeling like it, you tell your feelings to shove it, and you do it. Because the Spirit of God in you actually desires that you do that regardless of how you feel and regardless of how it might look to others. So you don't let your shallow desires tell you what to do. You let your deepest desires, Jesus' deepest desires, tell you what to do. And so if it, if it ends up looking good to others, great. But if not, also great. Your concern shouldn't be on how it looks to others or how it makes you feel, but how it represents God to the world. It's about his glory. And if Jesus is your treasure, that means you ultimately want to please him. So when you don't feel like reading your Bible, when you don't feel like being generous with your money, when you don't feel like being intimate with your spouse, when you don't feel like changing your baby's diaper, you repent of your sour feelings and you act out of love. Love for Jesus and love for others. You pick up your Bible because you know that this is an act of love to Jesus. You open up your wallet to be generous. You make a plan with your spouse. Or if you're even too shy to make a plan with your spouse, you text them your Barry White playlist. You change the baby's diaper. You do all these things because they're acts of love for Jesus and those he has called you to love. It's not hypocrisy to do good in spite of your feelings. It's love. See, when Jesus went to the cross, do you think he was doing so with no conflicting feelings? Do you think there was no struggle there? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was spending time with his father and he was praying. And as he was praying, he was pretty stressed out because the scripture tells us that as he prayed, he was sweating blood. That's some conflicting feelings right there. But as he prayed to his father, he was asking if there was any other way that salvation could be accomplished. So in a very real sense, he did not 
want to go to the cross unless there was no other way. But you know what he did with those feelings? He told his father, not my will, but yours be done. See, even Jesus, the sinless, perfect, spotless lamb of God, he had conflicting feelings. In his humanity, he had desires and temptations that just like us needed submission to the ultimate truth of God's will. So how much more do we need to submit our feelings to the truth of God's will? Probably a lot more. See, Jesus was no hypocrite. Jesus walked in full obedience out of love. And his fruit was evidenced by his willingness to set aside his own immediate desires for the sake of others and ultimately for the sake of the glory of God. You see, the thing with hypocrites, Pharisees, and legalists, when they obey, even if it seems like there's some fruit, eventually, the closer you look, the closer you get, what's going to be revealed is that their obedience isn't coming from a place of love and appreciation for Jesus. It's just, at the same time, it's just like those who completely disregard Jesus' commands because it all comes from just a deep-seated love of self. They do it to win approval of the people around them. And that's where it stops. And if they don't get the approval that they're seeking, well, they don't get what they deserve, that's when the thorns and the thistles come out to cut and damage those around them. The evil person, out of the evil treasure of his heart, eventually produces evil. So then Jesus continues in verses 47 to 49. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house, could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So Jesus is essentially saying there's two options. You either take the time to build your house with a firm foundation or you look for the easy way out and you just skip the foundation. See, being a follower of Jesus, even though we're saved by grace through faith, which is a gift of God so that no one can boast, it's a lot of work. There's actually a lot of work involved. Now, the work does not save us, but the work reveals whether we're saved. And Jesus is not afraid to tell you that. He's actually giving you the opportunity to count the cost here. And so he says, in the end, your life is going to be like one of these two houses. If you take the time to get to know him, to dig in deep into the sure foundation of who he is, if you spend time with him, if you, if you actually read through the scriptures to get to know him, to understand his character, to believe in him, to trust him, and to obey him, then when the floods rise, when the storms of life hit, and they will, all of us are going to have to face storms and challenges and troubles, difficulties. Your life will stand. If Jesus is your foundation, then your life will stand. You'll not be shaken so hard that you completely fall apart. You'll actually endure to the end. And still, all of that is God's grace. Now, we need to remember that even when Jesus' commands are difficult, and many times they will be, Jesus doesn't give them to us to burden us. But his commands are actually to lift our burden from us. There isn't anything Jesus tells us that isn't ultimately for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That means that Jesus is not out to ruin our fun, but he's actually out for our ultimate joy. Jesus wants the best for us. What we want does not compare 
to what Jesus wants for us. But on the alternate side, if you refuse to obey him, if you continue to act like his commands don't matter, even if you say you're a follower of Jesus, even if you put on a good show for others, where they think you're a follower of Jesus, but you actually disregard him and his word. Jesus says, it's like building on a house with no foundation. And when the storms of life come, you're going to get swept away. There's not going to be anything left. On the day that Jesus returns, where do you want to be? So maybe as we think through all this, you're still trying to figure out what's going on in my heart. Not, not mine personally, but what's going on in your heart. And so maybe you're trying to evaluate what kind of fruit are we producing? And maybe you're worried that you've not been treasuring Jesus. You know, other things have been taking his place as the treasure of your heart. Maybe even otherwise good things. Maybe you realize that you've been trying to live a life without that foundation of, in Jesus. You don't care about reading the Bible. You don't care about gathering with God's people. You don't care about digging in deep to know who he is. But if that's you, isn't it exhausting trying to hold yourself up? Aren't you getting tired of it? Aren't you tired of just trying to impress people by your own merits? Now here's the beauty. In spite of all that, no matter how you came in here today, no matter the state of your heart when you entered into this room this morning, if Jesus has pointing out where you fall short, if he's been pointing out where you're missing the mark, where you're not living in light of the gospel, where there is a lack of fruit, Jesus wants you to know right now that no matter what you've been going through, you can actually take that plank out of your own eye and you can repent and believe the gospel. That means you can believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin. Even the sin of trying to pretend you're not sinful. Even the sin of trying to prove to others that you're totally fine. The sin of completely disobeying, the sin of running away. Regardless of what sin you have, you can repent you can give it to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is yours. I'm not going to let my sin hold me down anymore because you've paid for it. You've taken it from me. And when you look at me, you don't see my sin anymore. When the Father looks at us, if we are in Jesus, if we believe that he has paid the price for us, he sees the goodness and the treasure of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So why would you go on trying to live like you're your own God? Trying to prove to others that you've got it all figured out. When all you could do is, you could just point to Jesus and say, he did it. He did it all. And now build your house on that foundation. Put your trust in his perfect work for your account. And now receive a new heart that's filled with new desires, new hopes, and this new treasure that comes along with forgiveness, mercy, and a grace that actually allows us to bear fruit in line with repentance so that we can now show the world who we belong to and who we follow. So church, are we going to be disciples of Jesus who follow Jesus, who live lives that show others who he is and what he's done? That's my prayer. So Father, I ask, that you would truly allow us to walk in obedience. That when people look at Grace Warman, they would see trees that bear abundant fruit. Not because we're so good, but because we have a good treasure. Jesus, I thank you that you are my treasure. Thank you for seeing fit to show me the truth of who you are and your glory. Keep me, hold me, help me to continue to trust in you. 
And if there are moments where I'm moving off of you as my solid foundation, Father, give me repentance and move me back onto that solid foundation of Jesus. I pray this for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.